The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. It's a lovely morning. The sun is shining, and the wind isn't blowing that hard, that much yet. So, good morning. Um, so, a couple of announcements for us this morning that I'd like to highlight. The first one is the more team that's hosting a takeout Ukrainian supper, and all the um, proceeds will go to support um, the Ukraine through PWSND, Presbyterian World Service and Development. However, you do need to sign up for it so that they know how many meals to make. So in the narthex, as you came in, you would have seen the table where Margaret was standing, and then there was another square table, a little green one, um, and this piece of paper was on it. And so it's very important that you write your name, um, telephone number, and the number of orders that you would like. Um, so that they, they know how many um, to prepare for. And I'm pretty sure this will be here for a few more Sundays at, at the back, so you still have time um, to, to complete this. So after the service, if you're thinking about it, um, then please remember to write your name. And I'm just going to give this to Isabel so she can return it so that I don't forget to take it with me. Thank you, Isabel. And if you have any questions, please ask Bob Epp after um, the service. Um, then... There will also be um, coffee after the service today and some of the, the cake that was left over from yesterday. So if you'd like to join us for coffee and some goodies after the service, you're more than welcome to do so. And uh, I was also asked to remind folks about the, um, the gift survey um, that went out. Um, so perhaps, perhaps sometimes we think, or sometimes we, we, we know, we know the, the things that we do in the congregation and we know that people know what we do. And so um, that might be our situation, and so we, we are thinking, well, why should I fill it out? People know what I do anyways. Um, however, um, we still ask you to please look through this, even if, if, if you know people know what you do, because there might be one or two things that you would like to do that you didn't know about. Um, so if you can look through the survey and complete it, that would be greatly appreciated, because it just gives the... Um, the session and, and um, the teams an overview of people that are available for help so they can take a quick glance at it and know. Because perhaps they will think that if we don't complete it because people know what we do, um, we may think that, well, you know what, John Smith doesn't want to do that anymore. That might not be the case. So if you can complete this, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, let me see. I think I've got... Oh! <laughs> so for the, for the following three Sundays, so Next Sunday, Sunday thereafter, and the following Sunday, you're not going to see, see me. I will not be here. So we're going to have Isabel, who will be leading the service for us next Sunday. Then on the last Sunday in May, it will be Reverend Eniko Boshkarash, um, who will be leading the service for us. And then on the first Sunday in June, um, Bob and Bill from the soup kitchen will be, well, Bob, the more team, and Bill from the soup kitchen will be leading the service for us on, on, on those Sundays. Okay, then there are some other announcements in the bulletin that they'll ask you to go through at your own time. Um, and again, during the, the service, during the sermon, um, if you like to do the word search, I will not be offended. Um, I might start speaking faster if I notice you're doing it, but that's okay. Um, no. Anyway, good, good. My friends, I now invite you to please stand and to join me in our responsive call to worship this morning. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. God chose the people of Israel to make a new beginning. Let us worship the God of the covenant. The God of heaven and earth. My friends, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal light, we pray, shine into our hearts today. Eternal goodness, we pray, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, we pray, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal love, we pray, have mercy upon us, that with all our heart and mind and strength, we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy to your holy presence. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. My friends, our hymn this morning is one that's 
most likely very well known for all of you. It's not in our hymn book, however, and it is just a closer walk with thee. <laughs> Friends, we cannot come before God unless we are very first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes that we make, and about how poorly we care for others. In this spirit, it is now offered to God our prayer of confession. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and gentle God, God of peace, Father of mercy, God of all comfort, Today, we confess before you the evil of our hearts. We acknowledge today that we are too inclined towards anger, jealousy, and revenge, to ambition and pride, which often give rise to discord and, and bitter feelings between others and us. Too often have we both offended and grieved you, O oh, long-suffering Father, forgive us. Forgive us the sin and permit us to partake of the blessing, the blessing that you have promised the peacemakers who shall be called, who shall be called the children of God. We pray this together in Jesus' name as we say, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. My friends, hear now these words of assurance, of pardon that comes to us from the very well-known passage, John 3, verse 16 and 17, that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have a life everlasting. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world might be saved through him and him alone. forgiven people who profess that Jesus is our Lord and King, how can we show our thanksgiving for all that God has done for us in Christ, for His forgiveness, for His love and His mercy? We can do so by living our lives according to the will and purpose that God has for all of humanity. And once again, hear these words that the Holy Spirit share with us through the prophet Micah when it says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God?
my friends, we continue with our walk through the Bible on the Minor Prophets, and we're coming really close to the end now. And today we get to the Minor Prophet called Haggai. Um, so Hag- so, so the, the, when it comes to the Minor Prophets, many of them write in about the same kind of period of time when um, the people were in Babylon in exile and they're returning. So a lot of their writing focus on, on, on that struggle that the people had. And Haggai in particular is writing to the people who went to, into exile in Babylon and now have come back to Jerusalem. But they are facing a very daunting task because the city of Jerusalem was left in ruins because that's what people did in those days. When you conquered another city and you're another nation, you break it down because you don't want the people to strengthen um, up again, right? And so after many years in, in exile, I think it was 70 years, they are coming back and they get to Jerusalem and it's in ruins. And they need to rebuild. And but the interesting thing that happened was is when the people first got, got back, they were very um, excited and, and encouraged. There was lots of, um, uh, I forgot the word now, uh, there. Uh, they just, uh, they really were into it. They were building, but then they stopped. They got discouraged for many reasons. And one of them, especially what Haggai is, is writing on, is they were opposition. Some people didn't want them to rebuild the city. And they, they was, and it's, we, we read in this in Nehemiah as well. And what the people did is there were some other people around, and they would come and would break everything down that the other people built up the following day. And so it was really a struggle for them to, to build everything up, and they were feeling very discouraged. And that's sort of one of the issues that Haggai is dealing with. And so he's giving them a word from God, and the word that God is giving them is, is a word of hope, encouragement, and it is this. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. And I think those are very important words for St. Andrews to hear. Um, because we may not face exactly the same thing that the people back then did. But we also go through times of discouragement, right? We all know that the vacancy is perhaps lasting a little longer than we have hoped for. And we may feel discouraged like the people in Jerusalem and wondering what's going to happen. What, why is things at the still stand? And I think God's word comes to St. Andrews and says, do not be discouraged. Have hope because my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. And it's very important for us as a church community to remember people are important. But just as people are important, so it's God's spirit that remains with us. And that, I almost want to say, is more important than having somebody who's in the pulpit constantly, right? And so remember, when we feel discouraged that God's spirit remains among us, we do not need to fear. That's a very important message for us today. Um, I think we're singing number 665. Have I got the number right? Oh, wait, no, 655. Uh, give me oil in my lamp. Um, and I'm going to find actions for that song. I just haven't done it yet.
friends, let us join our hearts in prayer as we ask God for guidance during the reading and the proclamation of the word today. Let us pray. Lord God, you have declared that your kingdom, your kingdom is among us. Open our eyes to see it, our ears to hear it, our hearts to hold it, and our hands to serve it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And Paul is going to share the reading with us this morning, but I am going to encourage you that when you go home um, to read Genesis chapters 37 through 50, because I was contemplating as reading it all, but I thought um, I might see a few hymn books flying my way if I say that. Um, so, if you can, when you get home, um, I really encourage you to read it because we know the story of Joseph quite well from Sunday school days, um, but there's part of the story we miss. Uh, I think we all know Joseph and the, he, you know, the, the coat he wore, and we know about Joseph um, providing food for people, but the in-betweens, we, we, we sometimes forget that, and it's a very important story in our Christian walk of faith, and so... Paul will read for us some selected verses from those chapters, Uh, but once again, I do encourage you when you go home or sometime during this week uh, to read the whole story of Joseph from the beginning to the end, and it starts around Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37 to 50, select verses. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then Judah said to his brothers, Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. Then Midianite traitors passed by. And they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him, bought him from the Ishmaelites. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had, in house and field. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. 
And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, and they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones, Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Hebrews 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions about his burial. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. Reading with us this morning. <coughs> well, my friends, lately I've shared with you quite a few stories, not just stories from scripture, but also story books um, that I enjoy to read. So I thought, why not share with you another one of my favorite books? This time it is, it's a, it's, it's a fiction, but it's an autobiography, and it is the story of, and I'm, some of you might have read her story or at least seen the movie, the story of Corrie Ten Boom, The Hiding Place, one of the best books out there. Corrie, if you do not know the book of the lady, um, she was someone who lived during the Second World War, and the story centers around what happens to her and her sister Betsy during that time. The family, as many of the families in Holland were, were hiding some, uh, were hiding Jews during the occupation. And Corey and Betsy had a very good life in the city of Harlem. Even during the occupation, still, while, still things were going okay for them. They were able also to, to be a light in a dark place for many people during that time. It was tough for them, but they had a purpose until that dreadful night when they were loaded onto trucks and sent to a concentration camp. When they arrived at the concentration camp, they were separated from their elderly father, who was a watchmaker. And Corey and Betsy had to share barracks with more people than humanly possible. Yet even during this troubling time, challenging time, the two sisters shared the gospel, they shared the good news with their um, fe fellow people. And there's one line in the book where they were standing in line to get food, get soup, and Corey was looking at the soup that she just received at the hands from this other lady, and she looked and, and she looked at the lady and asked, well, what kind of soup is this? The response, turn up soup. Corey said, but where's the turnips? I don't see any. It will turn up someday, was the response. The story reached a point where Corey just couldn't take it anymore. 
the work, the lice, the food, the circumstances just got too much. They were breaking her. She was upset. She was upset with God. Where is God? Why is God doing this to us? She couldn't take it anymore. It was then that her older sister Betsy, who was quite ill at this time, reminded her of 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15 through 18. And it says, See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. And her sister reminded you of of that part that says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Not just the pleasant circumstances, but all circumstances. However, Corey could not do that anymore. Not long after that, her sister Betsy died though. Corey then remembered what her sister has said that day. That Betsy, even in those dreadful circumstances, could see that God had a plan for her and Corey. It is at that point that Corey's life changed. My friends, I think all of us at one point or another have wondered, why me, oh God? Why is this happening to me? We have wondered, where are you, God? What is your purpose? We have said, God, this is not fair. Well, my friends, we are not alone in asking any of those questions. In truth, we ask those questions all the time. And oftentimes, like Corey, we had enough. And we cannot see the purpose of what is happening. What do we do during those circumstances? When life seems so unfair, when we cannot see God no matter how much we try, when we just don't understand. Now, this morning, let me share with you another story. A story from Scripture, perhaps a story that we know all too well. Few stories compared to the one Paul has shared with us, the one of Joseph. It is, in many ways, a masterpiece. It's a story that tells us what happened in a household um, when siblings feel that one sibling has been given unfair advantage. But it's more than that. Because it's also a story that tells us that God has a plan for his children. Even when we as God's children have a difficult time in recognizing that plan. And this story has everything in it. There is love, there's hate, there's jealousy and sorrow, there's tension, and there's even a sex scandal in there. In the beginning of the story, it's a little hard to to like the hero, Joseph, because he seems to be a tattletale, and perhaps a wee bit too big for his own shoes. Perhaps Joseph already understood what God had revealed to him through his dreams. Perhaps it wasn't Joseph's fault after all. Perhaps it was his dad, Jacob, who was the culprit in this. After all, Jacob made it crystal clear that Joseph was his favorite son in front of all the other kids. And Joseph's brothers despised him for that. They hated him. But regardless of how we feel about Joseph, as the story unfolds, we can't help but feel a little bit of sympathy for him. When those slave traders took Joseph to the unknown, we can't help but feel sorry for Joseph. And when we read how, how Jacob, his dad's heart, was torn in two, and, we, and when he saw his, his son, what he thought was his son's blood-soaked robe, we cannot feel but hear and see his tears and his heartache. Joseph's new circumstances were a huge adjustment for him. One moment... He was the apple of his dad's eye, the one with the new clothes. The next moment, Ishmaelite slave traders were taking him, dragging him through a desert. How did it feel for Joseph to be a slave in someone else's house? Now he had to hard work very hard with no pain. And if that wasn't hard enough, 
to adjust to his owner's wife. Liked him. She liked him a lot. Potiphar's wife had her own plans for Joseph. She could not understand why this young man couldn't or how he could choose to ignore her advances. He was a slave. What did he have to lose? Little did she know what was important for Joseph. Trust was important for him. Potiphar trusted Joseph. How could Joseph betray that trust? Yet there was something else as well. Hebrews 11 reminds us of Joseph's faith. It was through Joseph's faith that he stood on his principles. Even when Joseph was thrown into a well, when he was taken from his parents, he believed he held on to his faith. So why did God allow this to happen? His dad, Jacob, probably told Joseph many, many times that God is good and God is faithful. And if that is true, then what is he, what is Joseph doing in Egypt as a slave? Regardless of this question, Joseph still held on to believe. He still had faith in God. So he said no to Potiphar's wife, to her advances, even though it would cost him time in an Egyptian prison. Joseph must have reasoned that even though losing everything he had, he could not lose his relationship with God. And that reasoning served him quite well. Because God did remember him while he was in prison. In prison, if we remember the story, he met two people, a baker and a um, wine bearer, who had dreams. And it was the wine bearer who remembered Joseph, who interpreted their dreams, and he told Pharaoh about it. About Joseph. Though it was about three years after that. And when Pharaoh took Joseph out of prison, Joseph's life started to fall into place. God is faithful. He revealed to Joseph the meaning of Pharaoh's dream. And remember, if you remember the dream, it was the one where the, um, the skinny cows who ate the fat cows and the, the skinny weeds that absorbed the um, fat wheat, uh, wheat, which was a dream for the famine that was coming. And Joseph, though, made it very clear to Pharaoh that it wasn't he, Joseph, who interpreted the dreams, but it was God who revealed the meaning to him. So Joseph was giving God the glory. And as Pharaoh listened, he knew that Joseph was the guy to make things work and help them through the famine. Joseph has to be in charge of Egypt so they could survive this drought and coming famine. That very day, Joseph went from being a prisoner in an Egyptian jail to the second highest person in Egypt. Second most powerful man in Egypt. Was Joseph happy with the development? Did those Joseph realize that this was God's plan all along? Did he wonder if God had sent him to Egypt to, to save the Egyptians from the famine? Then one day, something unexpected happened. His brothers, the same ones who threw him in a well and sold him for 20 shekels to slave traders, came to Egypt to buy food. And whom did they have to buy it from? Joseph. I think it was probably then that Joseph really understood, really understood, really got it, that God is faithful. And that God had a plan for him all along. Keep in mind, what Joseph's brothers did to him was despicable, to say the least. And I'm being very kind when I say that. But we cannot blame God for what Joseph's brothers did to him. It was their actions, not God's. However, what we can say is that God, in God's mercy and grace, made their actions, Joseph's brothers' actions, part of his plan. And we see how a most unfortunate event now becomes a blessing as Joseph's own people are saved from famine. My friends, at times... Oh, I need some water before I continue. At times, it is hard to understand God's plan, God's will and purpose. Oftentimes, the more we wrestle with it, the less we understand it. 
At night, when Joseph was sleeping in Pharaoh's house, he must have cried longing for home. Never did it cross his mind that he would be grateful for what happened to him that brought him to Egypt. Right? And those days when he sat in the prison cells, jail, those must have been long days, and he must have thought long and hard to try to understand what on earth is he doing there. How do you understand? How do you come to terms when these, th these things happen to you? It wasn't until many years later when Joseph looked back at what had happened and he said, and this is from um, Genesis, uh, I think it says 45 there, Genesis 45. Joseph said, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all of the land of Egypt. Only then, many years later, did Joseph understood. And perhaps that's why Joseph's story has such a pull for us. Because isn't it true that all of us have tried to make sense of what is happening in our lives at times? We know what it feels like not to understand wonder. Even when we really try to make the best sense of life. In our world today, in our lives, every day things happen to Christians that we, that they don't understand why it's happening. My friends, faith, belief, and I think this is what Joseph's story teaches us as well, is that faith, belief in God, doesn't mean that we understand everything. Faith, belief in God, doesn't mean we understand everything, nor that we may understand it like Joseph did. See, when we have faith in God, when we believe in God, we don't always have to understand. It is simply enough for us to know that God has a plan and to know that God, regardless of what is happening, has the power, has the grace to make it work for the best. The faith that enabled Joseph to manage those tough days in the beginning enabled him to prophesy to, to the Israelites that they will one day leave Egypt. And after all, it wasn't Egypt that God promised their forefather Abraham. God had promised them their own land, the same land where Abraham was a sojourner. And again, we see how faith enabled Joseph to look beyond the here and now. He looked beyond the here and now. Humanly speaking, there was no reason why the Israelites would eventually leave Egypt because there was enough food. Everyone was extremely happy. However, Joseph sees God's plan. God's people will go back to the promised land, even though it will happen many, many years later. My friends, faith doesn't mean that we will understand everything and all things that has, is, and will happen to us. Neither does faith mean that we will recognize God's hand in an instant. What faith does mean is trusting that God has a plan for our lives. Let me repeat that. Faith means trusting that God has a plan for our lives, for my life, for your life, for St. Andrew's. And that God will take even the unpleasant circumstances. Think about the story of Corrie ten Boom and the story of Joseph. God will take those unpleasant circumstances that we encounter, often at the hands of other people, and through His grace and power, is able to use it for good. Amen and amen. My friends, let us join our hearts uh, together in prayer. And I'm just going to... Make sure I give this back to Paula. Thanks, Paula. And now, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise today for the time that we can spend together in song, in prayer, in listening to your word. We give you thanks for the story of Joseph, a, a story that we know so well, a story that we've heard in Sunday school, but it's also a story that we might have misunderstood. 
in a way that what's happened to Joseph and what he experienced is something we can learn from in our own experiences so that, that we can apply what has happened to him to us. That the story of Joseph teaches us about belief and about faith. It teaches us that it's okay to have questions. It, it's, it's okay to ask the question, God, where are you? What's happening? It's okay not to understand. It's okay to have faith that you have a plan for our lives. And that even though bad things, horrible things may happen to us by the hands of other people, you can take that situation of God turn it into a blessing. Even though others intended it for bad, you can use it to turn it into a blessing for us and others. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us and guide us during those times in our lives when we don't understand. Those times when we are on our knees and like the psalmist David often asks, O oh God, where are you? Help us to remember the story of Joseph and the life lesson it teaches us about the journey of faith. Lord God, today we also bring to you in prayer those in our community of faith who are going through a difficult time, whether it is in body, mind, or soul, that you will give them comfort, that you will encourage us and give us courage to be there for them. And if it is a a shoulder to cry on that they need, that we will be that shoulder. If it is the ear they need for to listen to them, let us be that ear. If it's just someone to be there for them, help us to just be there for them. We also pray for the conflicts in the world. And today we especially bring to you in prayer the folks from the Ukraine. We can, it's a hard for us, Lord, to, to put ourselves in their shoes. And what their experience. It is not fun, it is not nice, it is terrible and horrible things happen during armed conflict. People stoop to despicable things. And so we pray, Lord, that your peace, your harmony will reign upon the earth. But we also know that that starts here. In our families, in our community of faith, in our city. Help us to truly live the fruit of the spirit of peace and kindness, so that your world may truly experience what it means to be a world at peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, our hymn is number 746, number 746, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
listed, there are the different way, listed different ways that you can continue to support the congregation. And the offering plates are, are still in the back, um, as well as we still do take the donations for, for the Ukraine, and it goes to Presbyterian World Service and Development, and there are extra um, envelopes at the back as well for that. Our doxology is number 661, verse 1 and 2, we give the Batang on. for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We give you thanks for the blessing of placing us in the lives of others so that we can share with them the good news, the good news of your peace and your harmony that may reign the whole earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. My friends, our closing hymn is also one of my favorites. I hope it's one of yours as well. Sorry, it's not in the hymn book, uh, but it is The Old Rugged Cross. Joseph, and know and be assured 
that believe, faith in God means knowing that God has, trusting that God has a plan for our lives. And now in the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Thank you.